Thanks, everyone. Uh, my name is Chris Whitaker uh, from Dawson College and uh, part of the Saltese group. Um, so uh, thank you for coming. Uh, welcome. Uh, before uh, we get going with the, the introductions, just a, a reminder that there's a poster session today at 4.30. Uh, it's a joint poster session with uh, Saltese and ISLS. Uh, so it's a nice opportunity to see uh, some of the work that uh, our community is producing, but also to see some of the work that the international um, community is producing in terms of uh, the learning sciences. So uh, after the next sessions are over, please feel free to go underneath uh, into the lobby of the building across the road. Uh, you can avoid the rain. So if you go down the escalators outside of here, uh, across straight uh, across it's in the library in the building across the road so that's at 4 30. Um, please take advantage of that and hope to see you there um, so to introduce uh, our keynote speaker for today um, I want to present Phoebe Jackson. Uh, Phoebe Jackson is a physical professor at John Abbott College and uh, one of the key members of the Salties movement. Dr. Phoebe Jackson. We'll unplug it. We're good. Okay, it is my uh, great pleasure to introduce Dr. Kelly Miller to you today. Uh, some of you probably know her. She's been coming to Salty East conferences for, well, we were trying to figure out how long. We're not sure, but it's a long time. Um, she's been a very good friend to Salty East over the years. Kelly graduated from Harvard in 2015 with a PhD in applied physics under the supervision of Dr. Eric Mazur, uh, a name we're pretty familiar with in these parts. Her doctoral work focused on improving undergraduate physics education with technology and active learning. So clearly a perfect fit for Salties. Before graduate school, Kelly taught middle and high school in Canada and the United States, and she even went on a year around uh, the world on a sailboat teaching physics. Was it physics? It was physics. So you, you get this picture that, that Kelly really is all about non-traditional active learning and teaching. She's very hands-on. Uh, now Kelly is a senior lecturer in applied physics at Harvard um, in the School of Engineering and Applied Science at Harvard University. So during her time at Harvard, Kelly's been engaged in so many different research projects and teaching projects that I don't even know where to start when I'm introducing her. She is a co-founder of Perusal, which is a um, collaborative reading platform that functions online. Uh, I can fully attest that Perusal actually helps your students learn through reading. Uh, she even, in fact, you presented on perusal at Salty's conference a number of years ago, which is when I started using it, and probably many of you too. And, and now we even use it as Salty's just to do uh, like peer reading groups with our colleagues. Kelly also co-designed and now teaches in uh, one of the most innovative physics courses that I've ever seen. Uh, but I will, she's going to be telling you about that, so I'm not going to spoil it. Um, Kelly's research into many of the facets of active learning and physics education have been groundbreaking. I, I'm not going to give you any spoilers because Kelly will be sharing her research with you today, but I will say that I, I do use what Kelly has been producing myself in my own teaching. Uh, I even use it, I even tell my students about it to help them get on board with active learning. It's this... This is what makes Kelly's work so useful is that it treads the boundary of practice and research. Uh, all of us here probably believe that, you know, active learning when done well can work, but Kelly's the one out there showing us how it works and giving us the evidence so that we can keep going. And she's not stopping there. She's continuing to push the boundaries and ask questions like, what are the challenges? Does it really work? And how do we make it work? Are there issues of bias and inequity? that we should be aware of and consider when we're teaching. And she'll be talking about that today as well. 
And it's questions like these that make Kelly's uh, work applicable across all the fields, not just in physics education research, and a perfect fit for this year's conference. But before I hand you over to Dr. Miller, I also want to introduce her on a more personal note. Kelly was one of the first people I met when I moved to Montreal 15 years ago. We were in the same PhD program at McGill University, and uh, we probably gravitated to each other because we're, we were older than most of the other students, and we had both been teachers. But um, over the years, I've I've known Kelly now for a long time, and I've got to know very, uh, a lot of admirable qualities about Kelly. Um, and there's a few that have always stood out, and, and these are the things that make Kelly such an outstanding teacher and researcher, which you're about to see. First of all, she's wholeheartedly dedicated to her work uh, as a physics educator and as a teacher. And if you want evidence of that, just ask her where she lives. She, I'll leave that with you. She also has a natural openness to thinking about new ideas and big ideas, and she's not afraid to ask big questions and then dive into the research to find the answers. But at the same time, Kelly is a practitioner, and as such, she takes a practical approach approach to her teaching, to her research, to lunch, which is why her work treads that perfect boundary that Saltese focuses on between research and practice. And so now it's time to hand it over to Kelly, uh, and she's going to share with us her work into active learning environments and give us some insight into some of the issues that we need to consider as we move forward in our educational journeys. Kelly. All right, well, thank you so much, Phoebe, for that kind and generous introduction. Um, just mute this. So I can hear my voice coming back to me. Is that? Can we just uh, mute your speaker on your laptop? It is muted. Yes, yes. Because I'm hearing it in my ear. I mean, I can just keep going, but it's, it is. Yeah. Test one, two, test one, two. No, no, that's, that's the mic. We need this speaker. You know, if you have settings. Okay. Uh, uh, electronic format. Test one, two, test one, two. Oh, I'll click the on there again. That's one, two. I'm not sure why. Okay, I'll That's just yell at that. Oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. Very fast. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, sorry for that. Okay. okay. Well, thank, thank you, you so much for inviting me. Thank you, Liz and, and Michael and everyone else at Saltees for having me. I'm very excited to be here. As, as Phoebe mentioned, I've been coming to this conference for a long time, and I'm honored to be able to speak to you today about my work. So as Phoebe mentioned, um, I'm on the teaching faculty at Harvard, uh, have been since 2015, and I've also been doing research on active learning environments, and that is going to be the focus of my talk. So I've divided, divided the talk into four parts. parts. First, I'm, I'm going to provide some context for the research that I'll be later discussing during the bulk of the talk. I'll explain what active learning looks like at Harvard by explaining this course that I've been heavily involved in teaching and designing over the last several years. And then I'll describe my research projects that 
outline and, and underpin some of the challenges that I see in operating in teaching and learning in active environments. The first of these research projects involves analyzing data that we've been collecting from peer assessments, which is the common method of assessment when using project-based learning strategies. Then I'm going to look at some work that we've been doing on self-efficacy um, in, again, in active learning environments um, and trying to figure out how this is related to the gender gap that we see in physics education. And then finally, I'll talk about a study that we published back in 2019, which looks at students and perception of their own learning when they're in active teaching environments and trying to sort of mitigate some of these feelings of, of knowing um, that are problematic from a student point of view. So I'll talk, I'll talk a little bit about that after that we published back in 2019. There, 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 I don't know if people are getting this. Is that all you've got? Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Sorry. That's okay. Maybe you can start starting again. Is it your mind? Yeah. Good thing. So Josh, mute me up there. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'm sure that after we're going to have lots of questions. Uh, Check that one, one, two, one, two. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. So has maybe that's something like it. So we should be on the other. We also encourage you to put these questions um, online or send in questions to some sort of uh, panel. That, uh, <laughs> Should I should I just go? Is that, oh it's it sounds okay now. <laughs> okay. Uh so I mean do you really want me to restart? Um <laughs> No, okay, okay. This online was hard for everybody too, so. Uh. <laughs> well, I guess we're on camera. Okay, good. Okay. Okay, all right. Yeah, so, so I'm first going to talk about the course, and then I'm going to talk about three research projects, all of which are related to active learning. That's the, that's the outline of my talk. <laughs> <laughs> okay, was that? Yeah, no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so so the context part. All right, so Phoebe mentioned this course that I've been teaching and, and I, I was part of designing this course. Um, the course is called Applied Physics 50 and it really represents the, the sort of pinnacle um, active learning environment at Harvard. There's a huge range of teaching that goes on in the physics department and in the applied physics department at Harvard. There's still very traditionally taught classes. This represents the, the extreme at the active learning end of the scale. Um, so I, yeah, so it's the, the course is, um, it's, it uses a completely flipped model. Students engage in a pre-class assignment using perusal before before coming to each class, which prepares them for the activities and the projects that they engage in during the class. This is the room that the class is taught in. So you can see it's it's a completely flat classroom. Um, the furniture can move around easily, whiteboards, the tables all move around. Students are sitting around round tables where they can interact with one another. 
um, and with the teaching staff who are circulating around answering questions. So there's no lectures in the course. All of the class time is used for activities and projects. And the class is designed to completely take the emphasis off the faculty member and onto the student and to the interactions that they have with one another and with the, the teaching staff. In addition to being a flipped class, AP50 is based on um, team and project-based learning. Students are organized into teams and they engage in all of the, the various in-class activities and the projects in the context of these teams. So this is what the schedule looks like, just to give you sort of an example of how the class is structured. Each of these um, colored blocks represents a different type of activity all of which have varying degrees of scaffolding. So at the beginning of, the, of each sort of cycle of each unit, the activities are more highly scaffolded. They involve more instructor, um, instruct, and the instructor is leading more of the activities. And then as you move towards the end of each of the units, the, the activities become more unscaffolded, open-ended, and finally, there's sort of a, an assessment that happens um, in the form of um, a, a collaborative exam that the students take and um, a project fair, which is where they, they present the project that they've been working on. So this, oh, and just go, going back to the, the schedule. So all of the white that you see where there is not a colored block is unscaffolded time for the students to work on whatever project they're working on at the time. Okay, so the colored blocks represent sort of activities that are structured in varying degrees of scaffolding. And then the white space is, is project uh, time for, for the teams to work um, together on their projects. Here's a summary of the six different types of activities. So, so these different blocks correspond to the different colors that you saw on the preceding slide in the, in the schedule slide. Um, and, and that makes up sort of collectively the, the programmed time of the class. The class meets twice a week for three hours each class, and that represents the entire meeting time. There's no outside tutorials or labs or sections. All of the, all of the structured time is encompassed in that two, three hour blocks. Um, the semester is divided into thirds, um, and each of these, each each block of, of time um, is is taken up by like a month long project. Okay, and at the end of each project, which are the three days that I've circled here, um, is a project fair day where students have um, is the culmination of all of what they've been working on with the project. So. At, on each of these project fair days, the students come with their teams and whatever design artifact they've built. And we bring outside judges in from, you know, outside the department or outside the university to come in and, and evaluate their work. And they present, a, um, there's usually some sort of a competition where they're, depending on the project, they're competing um, one team versus another. And then they're presenting what it is that they've built to the judges that, that come in. Um, now, I just mentioned that we do three projects this semester, that this shows what, the, what those projects are for the fall and the spring. Um, in this fall semester, the first project, we have students build a little car um, and then study the kinematics of that car through um, video analysis. Uh, the second project, we have them build uh, a Rube Goldberg machine. I have some pictures and videos that I'll show you in a second. And then the third project, we have them design uh, and build a musical instrument and then study the acoustical, the, the sort of wave properties um, of the sound that comes out of those instruments. So um, these are some, pro or some pictures um, of what the project fair days look like. So here's a picture from the first project fair um, the drag race uh, project where students are building these little cars. Um, they, as I mentioned, they, they so they, we give them kits and then they have some choices with respect to propulsion mechanisms that they can use. Um, there is certain design constraints that they have to meet. And then the task on the project fair day is they, their car has to be able to go within a certain distance of a set distance that we don't tell them until the project fair day. So they have to be able to like calibrate, you know, their car in real time. 
Um, here's a team, you know, uh, who's getting ready their, the car that they've built for, for testing. Um, and here's another, there's another <laughs> project. Uh, there's another team. Um, so the second project, I mentioned the students have to build a Rube Goldberg machine. Um, each, so the Rube Goldberg machine has to have eight different steps and each step has to demonstrate a specific principle of physics. So for example, they have to have um, an inelastic collision in their machine. They have to have a, an elastic collision. They have to be able to demonstrate conservation of momentum. They have to have something exerting torque on something else. They have to show uh, constant circular rotation. Um, so, so eight different steps. Um, and the last step of the machine has to crack an egg open. Okay, and so that's, you can see here an example of one of the machines um, that one of the teams built. And here's a, another, here's another example. And so this is, students have a, approximately a month. They, they can order supplies. Um, they have a specific budget that we give them. And then they, they put this together and they have to calculate how much energy um, each step encompasses. And so they have to have a, a total energy calculation for the entire machine at the end of the day. So that's the second project. The third project, the musical instrument, um, in addition to building a musical instrument, the students had to make a video explaining the physics behind the instrument that they built. And so I have two um, short clips of, of videos that students made just to, to show you what that third project looks like. Hey guys, so we made this bigger piano and this is our prototype. So we started out with these sheets of metal that we cut to different lengths so that it changes the frequency and the pitch. And then we nailed it onto this piece of board which is a soundboard. And they use this metal rod and the bridge right here. And this is our guitar. We made it out of a box. Got six strings, and you can rock your socks off. We made it for this class. Which we draw in a pack. The thicker the string, then the slower it vibrates. The slower it vibrates, then the lower the frequency. The tension matters too. When it's tighter, the note is higher. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, yeah, so that shows you sort of the the spirit of of um, of these projects and the, and the sorts of things that students are working on for the, at least the project part of the um, of the course like i mentioned all of the other activities are really designed to provide students with the content knowledge and the skills that they need to be successful in the projects so all of the course is is really structured around the projects themselves um, i wanted to talk a, a little bit about the assessment for the course because i think assessment how the assessment is structured is fundamental to the entire design of a course um, and also because uh, assessment is relevant to some of the research that I'm going to describe later in, in this presentation. So the, 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 the students are evaluated heavily on the projects. There, there are a number of deliverables that come out of, of those. Um, you know, the, the final presentation that they give, they have to create a final report. Um, and there's all sorts of milestones that they have to meet along the way. So it's, it's a relatively structured process. Um, there are also these, um, what we call readiness assurance activities. And, and these are the highest form of, of high stakes. Um, this is the closest that we have to high stakes um, testing in the, in, the, in the course. Everything else is, is mostly based on group work um, and sort of collaborations. So how these work, and these are two part collaborative exams. I'm sure many of you are familiar, familiar with this form of assessment, but basically how it works is students um, answer 10 to 12 questions individually, and then they submit that work, and then they get together with their teams and they have to answer the same 10 to 12 questions. And we have five of these over the course of the semester. And this, the philosophy is we don't want students 
to move on until they've mastered the content that we think is necessary for them to be successful during the projects. And so we, we call them readiness assurance. You know, it's a it's a sort of euphemism for an exam, but really it's it's the philosophy is we want them to make sure they've mastered everything before you know the, the next step. Um, and because it's got a collaborative component, which everything in this course does, it feels a lot lower stakes than a regular exam. And 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 so the grade that they get for that assessment is fifty percent based on their individual score and fifty percent based on their on the collective team score. Okay, so another way that we assess students um, is through um, peer assessments, and this is one of the things that we've done a lot of research on. Um, so we evaluate students' ability to work effectively as part of a team, and for this we call we use CATME. And I don't know if, if any of you, I'm sure many of you are familiar with PATME as an instrument. This is a, a platform that was developed by Purdue University. And I believe Saltese has had events, you know, explaining what CATME is, but CATME stands for Comprehensive Assessment of Team Member Effectiveness. And it's a very, uh, it's a very effective platform in, for evaluating teamwork. And right now, all of the courses that involve any kind of teamwork in the School of Engineering at Harvard use CATME. We have, we have a license for it and, and it's used extensively throughout the department. How it works is students are evaluating each other on the, on the other team members on five different individual metrics and then there are three team metrics. So the, the five individual metrics are contributing to the team's work, interacting with team mates, keeping the team on track, expecting quality, and having related knowledge, skills, and ability. So those are the five criteria that we have them evaluate each other and also themselves at the end of each team experience. And then in AP50, what we do, after they've completed project one, we reshuffle them and we assign them to a new team so they can use the experience and the feedback that they got from the preceding team experience going forward into the next project. This is what the form looks like. I'm not gonna you know, talk too much about CATME. I just want you to know sort of what it is so that it'll frame the research. But um, the, so for each of the five criteria, they, they have a, a form like this that they are um, clicking basically radio buttons that describe a behavior that is relevant to that construct. And so they, they click the appropriate radio button for themselves and then for all of the other members of their team. And then these are the three uh, team questions it, that they're sort of overall evaluating the experience that, they're, that their team. Um, so we've done a lot of analysis of the data from the peer assessment over the years that we've been teaching AP50. And one of the things that we've been interested in is whether there are any biases in this data. Um, and we've looked at both gender and um, underrepresented minority bias. And that is, that's what I'm going to now segue into is the research that we've been doing in those two areas. So just to, to frame this, so these are the five criteria that the students are evaluating both themselves and, and other team members on. We've, we've grouped these, um, the first four, we're, we call for lack of a better descriptor, soft engineering skills. You know, these are sort of like the bookkeeping, keeping the team on track, you know, making sure that everything is, is running smoothly. And then the fifth criterion um, is the one that we typically care about as, as physicists, um, which is having related knowledge, skills, and ability that we're calling hard engineering. Okay, and, and we see very, very interesting uh, biases in, in the data along this breakdown. Um, so, so this is um, one of the four soft engineering on the left. Um, I only included keeping the team on track because the other four corresponding plots look identical. There's no difference. I mean, we, we could have, substituted them in and you wouldn't notice a difference. So they're, they're very similar, all for a uh, soft engineering construct. On the, on the y-axis is the average rating that 
um, students get from other team members. And um, the groupings are whether you're a male student rating another male student, whether you're a male student rating a female student, whether you're a female student rating a male student, and whether you're a female student rating another female student. And, um, and then on the, on the right hand, we have the exact same uh, plot, but for the hard engineering um, skills. And so it's really the, this comparison um, that, is, that is relevant. Female students get high ratings on the soft skills, especially by other female students. Um, but male students rate female students lower on the hard engineering skills than they rate other male students. Um, compared to on the soft engineering skills where there's no difference in how male students rate female students, com again, compared to how they rate other male students. So um, we took this data. Does anyone have any questions on this? It's kind of a lot to, yeah. Teams self selected? No, the teams are um, highly contrived. Yeah, they're, they're, the teams are engineered. We, we, uh, we have all sorts of ways that we balance the teams um, along. We have them take the FCI and we make sure the average FCI score is the same. And then we construct them for other, you know, gender balance, uh, racial balance, that kind of thing. Um, good question, yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. Three or four. So, so most of the teams are four. A, a few of them are three. Um, 17, 18. Yeah. And the class has grown a lot in size over the years that it's been taught. And um, but for for these data, it was 17 teams. Oh yeah. Yes, great question. Yes, it's all anonymized. So that's one of the great things about CatMe from an instructor point of view. Everything is, you just have to click buttons and it's anonymized. And as soon as the peer assessment is complete, you can release the feedback to the students and it's it's presented in a way that is, is very easy to digest and it's also uh, completely anonymized. Yeah. Um, so the feedback that we have received, I, I, so first, first of all, I'll preface. So the question was, what do the students think of, of, of the results? Um, so let me preface my answer by, um, as the instructor, I read through all of the feedback and I make sure that there's nothing um, hurtful. Um, so I do a little bit of filtering. Um, I mean, we've also, there have been a few Title IX cases that have come out of things that other, that students have written about each other. So it, it, it tends to be something that if, if there's going to be a sensitive issue, uh, you know, as a result of a team not functioning well or some sort of harassment, it, it often comes out in the, in the CATME assessment, which is interesting. Um, the students find it highly valuable. And, and in the course evaluation at the end of the semester, um, they always comment on the fact that one of the most important skills they take away from the course is not the physics, but the ability to not be a jerk or, you know, like to work, to work well with other people. And yeah, we have not, and we're in the process of evaluating self-assessment. This is only peer. That's a great question. Yeah. Uh, you mean uh, interact? We have analyzed, I'm about to show you the race. We haven't done um, like interactions between race and gender, but but we have done uh, race, which I'll show you in a second, but yeah. No, that's a great question. Yes. That's an excellent question. Yeah, the question is, uh, have we looked at the data pre versus post pandemic? And the answer is we have not. This is from pre pandemic. Yes, but it would be fascinating because we have noticed that post pandemic students are much worse at working together than they were before. Yeah, that's a huge, a huge thing. Yeah. Have you tried, as you said, the team for engineer, have you tried making it so that the values are all the same? Um, in terms of in terms of gender, yeah, the the teams are gender balanced. 
Oh, no, that is the next step in this. Re yeah, that's I mean, what we want to do is we want to see what intervention could be made to mitigate these uh, biases, because this I think is, I mean, shock that when I found this, I was shocked because I mean, these are I, these are young, like educated people who have these biases. I yeah, I was very surprised. <laughs> I was very, OK. Okay. Yes. Uh, so that's being I'm going to translate on my monitor. Uh, group work evaluation. Uh, is it uh, is it is it strictly formative or is there some of the assessment is representative? Is it the is it formative or is it formative? Oh, that's a great question. Yes. So this does so so this does inform their final grade. It is um it's relatively uh, dichotomous in terms of like, only if there's a huge outlier, does it really, I mean, it's mostly, it's mostly formative assessment for them that they take moving forward. There is a small component that does factor into their final grade, but it's not, it's not huge. It's not huge. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yes. I just thought from me and my, I find this very interesting and the lives to know there. Just want to pay attention to this stay on the left and start with people. So yes. It, it does give the impression at first, oh my God. Yes. So it's that point. Right. So we actually re we replotted it. That's a great that's a great point. Yes. Yeah, we replotted it to illustrate the main takeaway from from the previous plot. And this is based on a regression model that controls for actual hard engineering or hard skills. We had them take um, a couple of different concept inventories, one of which was the FCI, but another was an engineering sort of background uh, skill checklist. And uh, we made a variable um, that we put into a model um, predicting um, the, the radar, um, which is on the y-axis, the, the, the overall score, and then um, on the x-axis is the gender of the person being rated. And then the corresponding colors are whether it's a male or a female doing the rating. So, so you can see that when males are being rated, there's, which is the two points on the left, the males being rated, there's no difference between whether they're being rated by a female or rated by a male. But when females are being rated, there's a huge bias. And this is controlling for how skilled female students actually are. So I think this is even more concerning. The, the, uh, the previous plot was just plotting so it's the straight averages, but this is controlling for, for actual ability. So um, somebody asked about the, the, the work that we've done on the racial bias. So when we look, at, at these data, uh, breaking it down by the, the race of the rater and the race of the ratee, um, we see another type of, of bias. So in the, in the soft engineering skills, um, white students rate black and Hispanic students significantly lower than any of the other three combinations. And then with the hard engineering skills, both white and other black Hispanic people rate black and Hispanic people as lower than white students. So the, those are the two sort of concerning bars on, that, on those two plots. So given that peer assessments are being used as an increasingly important form of assessment in higher education and especially in STEM, um, it's important for us to, to understand and to study how both race and gender are, are playing a role in biasing this kind of data. Um, so peer assessments are, are not the only um, tool in um, team-based learning. Um, by analyzing data from peer assessments, we can learn a lot about equity and inclusion um, in active learning environments. Here's a summary of the, the takeaway uh, points um, from, from that study that I just described. So, so as I said, peer assessments are, are increasingly important and used. Um, it's important for us to study um, the, the biases that could be affecting them 
Hard engineering skills, we see a strong evidence of gender bias against female students. And uh, both hard and soft engineering skills, we see strong evidence um, of racial bias against Black and Hispanic students. Okay, so another research uh, project that we've been working on over the years. Oh, yes. Hi. I know what art is taught. What is the class? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, so uh, the question was, why are we not considering a socioeconomic background? Um, I mean, so it's it's much harder to do that. You know, the the uh, the IRB approval that we would need to do that would we would probably never get it. Um, having said that, while I agree that that socioeconomics is a huge factor, um, the the disparity at at a place like Harvard is not as big as you would imagine. The um, the admissions what we're seeing is that there's a huge range of socioeconomics in the classroom. The admissions at Harvard is needs blind, and so it's not just sort of wealthy students that are that are being admitted. Um, but I guess the the easy answer is we just don't wouldn't be able to get permission to to include that kind of a variable in in this research. Yes. Maybe, maybe sorry, but just to keep going, sorry, because Kelly has a lot to say still. This is what okay. Uh, you mentioned that the results are anonymous. Yes. Um, for pretty revealing students, but um, if I'm a jerk on the team, I can always know I'm a jerk on the team. Um, how do we know whether students are understanding who it is they're talking about that is anonymized? Do they learn that much about themselves? Oh, okay. Yeah, sorry. I should have been more clear. Yes. Okay. So what happens at the end, that's a great question. What happens at the end of each pro project cycle is I, Kelly Miller, get a summary of all of the feedback that was written about me. It doesn't say like it was Phoebe who said this about me, but it it just like it gives us a, a list of all of the kind of comments that were that were written. And and the way Catme is is framed, or the way we frame it, is we ask students to write one thing that they think the person does well and one thing that they think they could improve. So it is a little bit sort of scaffolded in terms of, you know, and we say be constructive, be kind. You know, um, but but I I'm getting specific feedback for myself. I'm not like picking it out of a of a sea of comments. It's tailored to my feedback, but uh, I just don't know who wrote what. Yeah. Okay. 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 Great. So I I want to move on now um, to the uh, the the self efficacy. Um, study, and I'll, I'll go through this um, relatively quickly. So another research that we've been working on is tracking self-efficacy. Um, and um, in terms of providing some context for this research, um, let me start by defining what we mean by self-efficacy. So one's belief in an ability, one's ability to succeed in a specific situation um, to accomplish a task. And so we've been looking specifically at physics self-efficacy. So students' belief in their ability to do physics. Um, and the reason we care about self-efficacy typically is because it's a strong predictor for performance and persistence in STEM education. So there is a large and persistent gender gap in student self-efficacy um, in, in STEM disciplines. Um, this is well uh, cited in the literature. There is this really great paper uh, written in 2018 um, that I've cited here um, called Female Students with A's have similar physics self-efficacy as male students with Cs in introductory physics classes, a cause for alarm, question mark. So it, um, I highly recommend checking out this paper. Um, another thing that's well cited in the literature is the fact that self-efficacy decreases in traditionally taught physics classes. The Wyman group at Stanford has done a lot of work on, on this um, and has shown that students' self-efficacy at the beginning of the semester is typically higher than it is at the end of the semester. Um, the, on the other hand, the effect of active learning on self-efficacy is less clear 
in the literature. There's some literature that shows that self-efficacy goes up, some literature that shows that it doesn't change very much um, in the context of, of active environments. And then finally, looking at active and self-efficacy and gender, um, there's again, disagreement in literature about the effect of active learning environments um, on the self-efficacy of male versus female students. Um, and so we specifically wanted to look at that in the context of AP50. So we set out to answer these two research questions. Does physics self-efficacy change over the semester of an actively taught physics course in, in light of the fact that there's a lot of disagreement on this? Um, if so, how? And how does the change differ along gender lines, especially given what we just saw you know, with the, the, the biases that we saw um, in the peer assessment data? It wouldn't be surprising if, if female students self-efficacy you know, goes down, <laughs> there's clearly a bias against them. Um, so let me just briefly describe the methodology that we used um, in this study. Um, this is based on two years worth of data from AP50. Um, we designed and validated a survey that has 20 questions. And this is based on other self-efficacy surveys. We just tailored it specifically to physics. And we asked students to rate their own ability in physics across four different uh, dimensions. So conceptual physics, understanding, problem solving, collaborative work, and lab and hands-on activities. And there's a five uh, point scale that we use there um, that ranges from person saying, I cannot do this at all to um, it's, I'm highly certain that I can do this. So with respect to the first research question, we find that overall in the two years of data that we've looked at, looked at uh, students' physics self-efficacy does increase significantly um, over the course of the semester. And this we published um, back in 2019. Looking at how things differ along gender lines um, is where we start to see um, some interesting differences. So this, these two plots are the same plot, uh, the same as the, as the plots on the previous slide, just broken down by gender. Um, and so you can see that in both years, the female students have statistically significantly lower self-efficacy at the beginning of the semester, and that, that gender difference disappears by the end of the semester. Um, and so the gender gap that we see in self-efficacy disappears over the course of an actively taught, or at least this actively taught physics class. When we look at the gender differences across the different dimensions of physics, uh, we see even more interesting differences. So this plot on the y-axis is the change in self-efficacy, and the error bars represent the standard error of the mean. Um, so if the error bar crosses the zero line, that indicates that there is no significant change in the self-efficacy bet between the beginning and the end of the semester. So we see that that is the case in the with the males overall. The first two bars represent the overall self-efficacy. So there is, the, as we saw in the last plot, there is no difference in, in overall physics self-efficacy for male students, but there is a significant change for female students. And then when we look across the four dimensions, male students really only improve their self-efficacy in one of the dimensions, which is the lab and hands-on, which, I mean, if you, in a course like this, if that wasn't the case, you'd be really worried. Um, the female students change uh, in all of the dimensions, okay? And in terms of comparing male to female students, um, oh, this is hard to see because of that little box, but um, there are differences between male and female students in terms of the change across uh, conceptual physics, understanding, and problem solving, okay? As indicated by the asterisk at the top. Okay, so just to summarize this, I mean, this is sort of surprising given the first research project with, with respect to the gender bias, but male students initially have significantly higher self-efficacy in physics than female students. Um, over the course of this project and team-based 
class, the gender gap seems to disappear in self-advocacy. Um, and while that is um, true, Signif significantly, um, it's it's true significantly more, like the change in self-advocacy self is significantly more for female students than for male students. Um, and so some speculation is like, why, you know, what is the mechanism to explain this? Um, one interesting thing about both of these years that we collected this data is there were significantly more female students in the class than male students. It was, I think around two thirds female, one third male. Okay, it varied a little bit between the two years. Um, another speculation is the emphasis on collaboration um, and teamwork disproportionately helps uh, women, which is something that the literature does suggest. And then finally, the female students have, have, have been shown in, in lots of other literature to have higher uh, test anxiety than male students. And so the de-emphasizing of high stakes testing in this course um, and the, the, the focus on collaborative assessment uh, could be another reason why female students are disproportionately increasing self-efficacy over the course of the semester. Okay, so um, the last research project pertaining to active learning that I'd like to discuss is the one I alluded to at the beginning, which is looking at this concept of students' feeling of knowledge. Um, this was a, a paper that we published a few years ago where we measured students' actual learning in traditional versus active learning environments um, and compared it to their feeling of learning or feeling of knowing um, in an active learning environment. So feeling of knowledge is, um, is a topic that is written about prolifically in, in uh, science education. Uh, it's this idea that students assess their own knowledge. Like how do, how do they assess their own knowledge? Like following some sort of educational experience. Um, why we care about it is one of the strongest reasons for student pushback against active learning is that they don't feel like they're learning anything. So, so studying students' feeling of knowing something um, is, is actually like very relevant and very interesting. So th this is how we designed the study. In one of the physics classes um, that is on the more traditional end of the spectrum, I mentioned that there's a huge range of teaching uh, happening right now at Harvard in physics. The course that I've been talking about up to now, it represents the most active. This study was done in not the most traditional, but one of the most traditional, uh, traditionally taught courses um, in the physics department. So we did a controlled experiment where we assigned students to one of two groups. And for two different topics, we exposed them to two different types of teaching. So, um, for static equilibrium, which was one of the topics, uh, one group A got the active treatment, and then um, for the su for the subsequent topic, group A was passively taught um, in the fluids section. Group B saw the reverse. So it, for the static equilibrium, group B were, were pat just saw a traditional lecture for the static equilibrium topic. And then when it came to fluids, they, they saw the active version of, of that class. Okay, and the, the, it's important to note that the content was exactly the same for both. And at the end of each class, we administered a test of learning where, where we tested how much students actually learned um, from, from the class they had just experienced, as well as a series of, of questions about students' perceptions of how much they learned and how uh, effective they found the teaching. So um, this, this is what we found. Um, this is the, from the statics class. The first two bars show the results from the, from the test of learning. The light gray um, are the students who were passively taught, and so traditional lecture, and the dark gray were the students who were actively taught. Um, and then all of the subsequent sets of bars, the four remaining sets of bars, are the average level of agreement to questions about students' perceptions of their own learning. So, the, and that corresponds to the y-axis on the right-hand side of the plot. 
So this, this, this plot has two different axes. The left-hand axis corresponds to the test of learning. The right-hand axis corresponds to the sort of affect questions. So, so you can see that um, the two bars to, to compare are the first two bars compared to all the subsequent bars, right, which are anti-correlated. So the students who were in the active version of the class felt like they did not learn it as much when in fact they did uh, significantly better on the test of learning. Um, and then we see the exact same uh, trend for the, for, for the fluids part of the class. So I think when Phoebe at the beginning mentioned that she shows some data to her students to try to convince them that active learning actually works, I think this is, <laughs> this is the plot that you're referring to. So it's really compelling because there's an, a direct anti-correlation between how much students are shown to actually be learning in active learning versus um, how much they feel like they're learning. So just in terms of summarizing this, um, what we've done is, is shown this negative correlation between the two, the perception and the actual. Um, there is speculation in the paper that we write that cognitive fluency is to blame for this. When you, when you sit in a, especially a very well presented lecture um, and the lecture, the lecture that we used in the study is the best that, that we have in the physics department. He, he's able to make things sound amazing when he talks, you know, like you, you listen to him talk and you're like, yes, I absolutely understand everything. Um, and um, so there's a, a sort of a, a trick a trick that happens, you know, where you you feel like they're, they're, the, the lecture is so fluent that you feel like you understand it. And then when you go home to do the homework, it's, you have no idea how to do it. So um, the, there's also some literature that shows that novices have poor metacognition um, and are actually ill-equipped uh, to judge how much they've learned. And that's certainly what we see here. Um, and students um, unfamiliar with active learning um, may not appreciate how one of the things about active learning is you have to struggle. And that's part of the benefit that you see at the end is, is, the, is struggling through and, and trying to, it's the struggle that is associated with the learning. And while it feels bad, and then while it feels like you're not learning anything, um, it's actually what's, what's helping you sort of, you know, conceptually change your ideas. Um, and then finally, the, the sort of takeaway from this paper is that it, the importance for instructor, instructors like what Phoebe does to frame active learning well, you know, to present it at the beginning. To, we always, at the, on the first day of AP50, we always say, you're going to be incredibly frustrated. You're going to think that we're not actually teaching you anything. You're going to be, you know, upset by the way things go but just know that that is actually like a common feeling and that that's associated with actually learning. You know, so, so framing it in such a way that you set up students' expectations and you, um, you know, explain to them the benefit of it. Um, and just to summarize sort of overall, um, just, you know, that the, the three research projects are, and, and kind of how I see them fitting together, I, I just wanna leave you with three takeaway points. Um, so the first, instructors should use peer assessments. They're incredibly powerful tools uh, in team-based, in active learning environments, uh, anywhere where you have students interacting with one another, um, you can use peer assessments. Um, but you know, recognize that they have um, inherent biases. Um, the second point is that active learning um, is effective or has been shown to be effective in closing the, the self-efficacy gender gap. Um, and I think it's a very important thing and very easy thing to measure at the beginning and the end of the semester, just to, to have a sense of what's going on in your classroom. Um, and there's a lot of research that has been written on how to create a learning environment in your classroom to promote uh, self-efficacy. The Florida International University has done a lot of work on this. Um, and I, I think it's important to, to sort of to look at that. And then lastly, the idea that um, instructors need to be aware that students' um, inaccurate perception of their own learning um, can taint how they feel about it. 
And I think this is particularly important when evaluating your teaching uh, feedback or like teaching, um, I don't know what you call it, like the, the, we call it the cue. At the end of the semester, we get feedback, both numerical and written on our teaching. And traditionally active, in, when you're teaching in an active environment, your teaching evaluations are often not as good as if you lecture and you're very good at lecturing. Um, and I think that it's important for instructors and also for administrators to not look at those teaching evaluations and say, oh, active learning is not working because students believe it's not working because we've shown that their perceptions are often inaccurate. So that is that is what I wanted to share with you. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> Thank you, Kelly. Um, so we uh, have, um, but I'd like to uh, go right up to the 12 o'clock time limit. So we have lots of time for questions. So uh, we can stay uh, after that maybe a little bit. Because yeah. we have an hour and a half for lunch. Um, but I'm sure there are lots of, of questions that are in the audience. What I'll do is I'll come around with the mic or speak with the mic, ask a question. And then uh, once you've done the questions, you can get the mic back to me. But they go on a little bit of a And then I'll while tell you answering the question. I will then find the next question and get ready and appropriately with the mic. So okay, there's a couple online as well. Good. Okay, uh, hands up. How about starting with the one while you find the person who will start with the one online? Sure. Okay. So, uh, yeah, okay, very good. I just wanted to say, and I just wanted to follow up on the question we had earlier and the context of the other one. The hero allegation. Or, and I just asked, is it deeper? Is it deeper in the brain or the brain? And that's what it is. I'm only saying that out of your assessment. Yeah, so so like I mentioned, the um the effect of the, the peer assessments is mostly formative. Um we do it's it's hard to explain this without showing the entire um we use something called specifications grading. And um I don't know if I mean I could give a whole talk on specifications grading, but I don't know if how many of you are familiar with it. But it's it's basically like there's no percentage that you're calculating. You have to meet the specifications, which are specifically defined um, on a number of different criteria. So the peer assessments are like one of those criteria in the course that you just have to meet. It's a it's a binary uh, determination. So you have to meet the specifications in peer assessments, and you either do or you don't. The cut the cutoff that we use in terms of determining what whether it's a check or an X is very, very, it has to be like a huge, like everyone has said that you did absolutely nothing and that you were a huge pain, you know, like that, like that, the, you know, like the meeting the specifications on that criterion is not difficult. So, you know, the, the, therefore it's not informing your final grade that much, unless you're a huge problem. It's mostly summative. Formative. It's mostly formative. It's mostly for feedback for the person. Yeah. Thanks a lot for being here. Very interesting. I was just curious to know whether the study is also uh, available for graduate level students. But I guess that for graduate level for the upper students, there will be. Uh, yeah, that's a great question. So your your question is whether we've done this study also at the graduate level. Okay, to my knowledge, I mean we haven't. Um, I don't know if it's if if similar studies have been done at the graduate level. My suspicion is that it wouldn't be that. Just having gone to grad school, I, <laughs> my self advocacy. I mean was lower <laughs> in grad school than it was in undergrad. But uh, I don't think it would be that different. 
but I but I don't know. We didn't. We've only done it at the undergraduate level. Yeah. Hello. Hi. I have a happy learning or project this. The students have a full time. Yes. Full time. I don't know. My concern is that in traditional education, you have a lecture, you follow the knowledge, not the book, all that, like the Eric Majority textbook. You follow the book, then you have a 15, you have 15 weeks plan. Each plan makes your theory. Now, at the time, it's meant to take all the material. Yeah. Now, this thing, you have to bring back the least perfect, it involves experiential knowledge. And that overall, we may not have all the knowledge we can call our plan. At the end, we may not have all the knowledge uh, support the plan. And then they throw money for other courses. Now we say, oh, what? We did, we did some. Some activity carbon in the introduction later. Then the other things that the protect this is the knowledge may not follow the textbook of all, we not maybe one thing with uh woman comes to read this not like far. Yeah, it's not when they may not follow the knowledge more like side by side knowledge. Yeah, that's a good question. So just let me address your first question first, which is that in an actively taught class, you are not covering the same content as you are in a traditionally, is that, was that, that your concern? Yeah, so I mean, how we designed this course initially was we pulled all of the instructors who taught classes for which this class was a prerequisite, and we asked them to list the concepts that students needed to know coming into their class. And we designed the class based on that content. So there is no um, content that we don't cover that is expected for the next level. Uh, and, and, and the projects are designed so that all of that content is encompassed in the, so I believe that we do cover the same content or at least the content that is necessary for being successful at the next course for which this is a prerequisite. With we have cut some topics, but there are topics that I mean maybe three, uh, but there are topics that didn't appear on anyone's list. Um, and then I forget what was your second. You, you said something. The knowledge flow not. Oh, the knowledge flow not being the same as the textbook. Yeah. Yeah. So, so we use Eric Mazur's textbook and the. Uh, the flow is the same as what we have. I mean, we picked the textbook specifically because it represented the flow that we are interested in teaching. I think even if that's not the case, there are many ways. I mean, I think increasingly people aren't using textbooks anymore anyway. Um, and you can up, you know, you can use documents or open stacks, or there's all sorts of resources that you can pick and choose from to make it so that the flow does. I mean, I think you, you want to start with the projects. You know, the, I, I like this idea when you're designing a course, this backward design, you start with like the learning objectives and then you design the projects to meet those learning objectives and then everything else sort of goes backwards from there. So I think the, the textbook should be like the last thing that you that you worry about. It shouldn't be like, oh, I have this textbook. I have to base the entire course on it. You know, it's like, what do you want students to learn and then go backwards from there? And it, that's that's my philosophy. Yeah. Um, how do you want me? Can I just pick people or? Oh, oh sorry. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Uh, so what um, that's a great question. So not yet. Not yet. That is that's the next step in this. Now that we know that this exists, and I I only showed two years of data that that we've analyzed, but we've subsequently found it um, in other years. That I mean, we're sort of slowly catching up with the data because we've just got so much of it. So the next step is to see what kind of what kind of interventions could be put in place in the classroom. I I mean, one idea is to do what Phoebe does and to show this data and to, and um, another idea that we we've had and some other engineering classes at Harvard are actually doing but we haven't tried yet is having students take um, the Banaji's implicit bias uh, test 
there's the, there's a test that you can take and I can I can find the link and, and send it around. There's an implicit bias test uh, that is based on some research that a psychologist at uh, Harvard has developed where it's like you go to a website um, and it shows you a bunch of uh, like pairs of words and you click good, bad, you know, and then it shows you at the end, like what your biases are. Um, some of the other courses at Harvard have students do this as a first activity. And then they look at people's results to just to make them aware that everyone has has bias biases when they look at the world. And, and we haven't tried that, but I think that's that's a very good idea. Yes, guys. Just I mean, yeah, so so aside from the suggestion, so in terms of mitigating biases, I, I really like the, the one I just mentioned, um, this implicit bias test. I think that this is a really hard question. I, I, I don't know what can be done about this. I think it's like one of the hardest things about, you know, diversity and inclusion in the classroom is, I don't know that I want to show the, the data to students because I don't like, because of the concern that you just raised, where it's like, I don't want black and Hispanic students to see that and then to have this preconceived notion that they're going to be um, discriminated against. But at the same time, I want to make the white students aware that, that you know, that this exists. So I, I don't know the answer, <laughs> I, I really don't. But I think it's something that we should collectively as a community really turn our attention to. Okay, so just to let everybody know, I'm keeping track of who has their hand raised. So we, so don't be afraid. You know, if I thought after, um, after, remind me of your name, John. After John, there's uh, there's you, there's you, there's Diana, uh, there's uh, Hannah, and then there is uh, Ed, and then we've got two people over on that side. Oh, oh, sorry, did you back there? Yeah, you only heard. Okay. So my question is, um, one of the colleagues bringing her hand raised, and also back in the that often the consumers And so it's, it's better to just sort of maybe, you know, we don't know, we don't know what number of these are. So I'm wondering, do you, how do you respond to that? And do you approach those students that they can kind of form? What's the strategy to say, well, we're not going to say, not do this? Uh, yeah, that's a great, that's a great question. And it is a huge concern. I think one of the ways that, so we do coach, we we don't, I mean, unless something comes up from the peer assessment um, or a student reaches out to us directly, we don't coach students one-on-one -on, -one on this, but we do provide a lot of prefacing of, of, you know, each type of activity, you know, with like those of you who feel uncomfortable sharing your ideas in this activity, you know, uh, try to push yourself outside your comfort zone, but at the same time, just listening to other people talk has been shown to, you know, like sort of coaching them a little bit in terms of, you know, that you might feel uncomfortable. You should try to overcome that because it'll benefit your learning, but it, but you can also just sit and listen to your, your peers talk and that's fine. You know, sort of setting the, the expectations, I think is really effective. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's difficult. I, I think, it's one of those things that core, education is moving in this direction 
you know, away from just being able to passively sit and listen to somebody talk. And so the, and, and we say that, we say, look, like courses are moving so that you're being expected to interact with each other more and more. And we believe that that's going to prepare you better for what's going to come next in your lives. And, you know, it's hard and you should try your best, but that's the way it is kind of thing. I, that, that's, that's what we do. All right, I think one time for one more question. So, no, no. Okay, thank you very much. Um, it's a fascinating issue. I thought the last the first question was really good, where you um, brought your course. You wanted to know where your students have been going to the uni. But that's not available to the school teachers, they are students. And that we are not going to. Um, not that easy, but we're essentially a culture of the need learning the place of the mm -hmm. So then, so unless we can find some way of being able to teachers and educators to understand that some parts and some of these students are going to or in that kind of sense. Right. Right. Can we make a difference? Yeah. Yeah, I think that's an excellent point. I think one thing that I've heard many times um, on this, you know, when, whenever this issue comes up is it's not like, what does it really mean to cover something? And just saying it out loud once, does that mean you covered it? And it's not what you cover, it's what you uncover. <laughs> that, you know, that all of these sort of statements, which are basically saying the same thing. But I, yeah, I, I, I really believe that it's not, you know, listing all of the concepts on your syllabus and saying them once in class or having students read them in a textbook. It's not covering them. It's what they understand at the end of the day. So. Nice. Nice way to end. So. One of the things in, in listening to the questions and listening to the questions that come up during the fall as well, you know, saltines when we started out years and years ago, these kinds of conversations around data, analyzing, understanding what we're doing, what the impacts are of what we're doing, and kind of about the choices we're making in classrooms. You know, we weren't having these conversations. And so it's wonderful to see over the years come to this level. And I think one of the nice things is in of the Miller's work served as a bit of a, a template but for some of the things we might want to achieve in, in our communities. All of the presentations that many of you are giving sort of are you know, branching and the things we're trying to understand in our teaching in our classrooms. So I appreciate your questions very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for having me.